Chapter 6, wherein I learn some more physics involving parabolic trajectories and see the worth of literature. A daily routine evolved in the first week that was to carry me through my entire summer with Harris and the Larsons. Up while it was still thick dark, watch Louis feed and try to compete and get a little food, out to help with milking, searching carefully for Ernie on the way, eat again when milking was done, and then get in trouble. It wasn't that we tried to get in trouble. Indeed, Harris and I did not think in terms of trouble at all. It's just that many of the things we wanted to do, well, perhaps all the things we wanted to do, seemed to cause difficulties in some way that we had not expected. A good example of this theory is the problem that happened because of the Tarzan of the Apes comic book. Part of my treasures, along with the dirty pictures, was a goodly supply of comic books. Some of them were not so good. There were, for instance, two Captain Marvel comics that I didn't like, but among the better ones, Superman, some good Donald Ducks, and a couple of really good real war comics, there was my favorite, a Tarzan of the Apes bonus edition with a story about Tarzan in the lost land of dinosaurs, where he trains a Triceratops to ride by, to ride by hitting it on the side of the snout with a stick. Harris shared my enthusiasm for the comics, this interest would dis diminish slightly when he came to see the dirty pictures, but by the end of the first week, he hadn't seen them yet and had seen the comics, including the Tarzan of the Apes. His reading wasn't up to my level, but it was good enough, and the pictures gave him enough information to fill in the gaps. That guy was something, he said, closing the comic book. We were sitting in the open granary door. I was watching closely for Ernie, whom I hadn't seen for over fifteen minutes, usually a very bad situation. I now personally had been attacked by Ernie several times, the worst inside the outhouse. It faced the river away from the house, and so the door could be open, and it was fun to sit there and watch things down, the ri down by the river while I was going to the bathroom. Ernie had sneaked around the side of the outhouse and jumped me right in the middle of, well, just say that it was very lucky I was sitting on a toilet when it happened. And during the ensuing fight, really just me trying to get out of the outhouse alive, it looked like the toilet had been hit by artillery. So I watched closely for him and never went out in the yard without a board, which I was holding now. He never seems to touch the ground. What? Tarzan, Harris repeated. He don't never touch the ground. He just swings in them trees on them vines unless he's riding one of them big gooners. Triceratops. Whatever. He still ain't touching the ground, is he? I thought about it. No, I guess not. Might ought to be a good way to live. Just swinging around. Hmm. And herein lay one of the shining ability of Harris. L lay the one shining ability of Harris. He believed everything was real. When he went for the pigs, they weren't pigs. They really were commie japs, whatever that was in his mind. When he read a Tarzan comic, it wasn't just a made-up story. It was real. He thought in real terms, in a real world, in real time. The only instance I saw this vary was when I found out why Louis wanted the mice. The day after we'd mowed and gathered mice, I asked Harris why Louis needed mice. For coats, he'd said. Little coats. Coats? It's better to show you. Come on. He had led me to the granary. The downstairs of the building was arranged in wooden bins full of oats and barley and some wheat. Upstairs there was a rough wooden floor and a crude ladder on the side wall leading up through a hole. Harris moved up the ladder like a monkey, and I followed, still trying to imagine what he could be leading me to. Upstairs there was a big cleared area and in the middle of this a large wooden table, ten by ten feet easily, was set on thick wooden legs. See, Harris said, here's why Louis needs the mice. The table was covered with small carved figures. At first I couldn't understand. There were men and horses, and little cabins and small trees and teams of horses pulling sleighs full of logs. It's a winter logging camp, Harris said. Louis's always carving on it. Wow. It was incredible. There were dozens, hundreds of little men working at different aspects of logging, cutting down little trees with axes and small two-man saws, 
building little cabins, riding little sleighs, sitting in little outhouses. And every horse had gray fur, and many of the men were wearing gray fur coats. He skins the mice to make coats and horse hair. I said, for this? Yep, pretty slick, ain't it? He had shaken his head. It's all just little carvings. I think he does it because he's got brain worms. Got him when he worked up in the oak leaf swamp digging drainage ditches when he was young. That's why he does them, of course. They ain't real. It's all in his head. It was the only thing Harris didn't think of as real, and I was fascinated by Louis's dream world. I had gone up there several times since and looked at the table and still hadn't seen everything, and indeed was thinking of climbing up there again now to look at it once more, but I noticed that Harris was studying the barnyard with new interest. I hadn't been there long, but I knew when he had that look. It seemed the corner of his right eye went up slightly, and it gave him an almost evil gremlin appearance. It meant he had an idea, a new idea. Sometimes they were good ideas, oftentimes they were bad ideas, but they were never, never boring ideas, and always worth interest. What are you looking at? I'm wondering, he said, what Tarzan would have done if he'd lived on a farm. Uh, I don't think he... Do you suppose he would have had to touch the ground? I don't see how he would have... Or do you suppose he would have been able to swing all through the barnyard without touching the dirt? He stood and left me and went around to the back of the granary and chicken coop, and in moments returned lugging what seemed to be half a mile of thick hemp rope. I've been looking, he said, dumping the rope at the, my feet, and it seems to me a man could make it from the granary to the loft of the barn without touching the ground, then from the loft back over to that hay rack. We just tie the rope to that elm limb there and over there to the oak limb. Look, see there? If we get to the hay rack, there's even a place where we can swing out over the river if we have enough rope for it. I was looking at the rope. It seemed ancient, so old there was mold and mildew growing on it. I don't know. Come on, there's nothing to know about it. I'll just shinny up that elm and you throw me the rope and we'll do her. He was gone in an instant and halfway up the tree before I could say that I thought the rope would fall apart. Up here, throw me the rope. He had been cr he had crotch ridden out on the tree limb and was beckoning down to me. He seemed a mile up, and I had to throw the rope several times before he caught it. In a minute, he had it tied to the limb with what appeared to be eight or nine knots, and had dropped the end down to the ground and climbed back down. I tested the rope gingerly at first, then hanging on it with my full weight and finally bouncing. It held, but had spring to it, a little stretch. Here, hold it like this, and when I get to the granary roof, flip it up to me. How are you going to get on the granary roof? I asked, but he was gone again, a dust cloud coming up in back of him as he ran into the granary and disappeared. He reappeared almost instantly at the small window in the peak of the granary roof. It opened inward, and he pushed it over and wriggled out until he was half in and half out. Then he turned, reached up, and grabbed the peak of the roof and pulled himself up. Give me the rope! I whipped the rope sideways several times and finally managed to get it close enough for him to grab it. The way it works is, I'm going to swing from here over to the loft door of the barn and just whip inside and drop in the hay. On the front of the barn, there was a large opening for putting hay inside to store for the winter. The door opening was seven or so feet wide, and the big door was tied open to ventilate the, lo the loft. Inside, there was an old pile of hay left from winter. Are you sure you want to do this? I called up. You bet, and as soon as I do her, you can try it. I had pretty much up, made up my mind that there was nothing on earth that would get me to try her. Harris looked like he was a mile away, sitting up there straddling the peak of the granary, though I was completely willing to help Harris. He stood, wobbling on the peak, his bare feet holding at the hip and ridge, and held the rope. I eyed the swing it would take to make the barn loft, and while there was still some doubt, I nodded up at him to give him confidence. And in truth... I thought he might make it. Yet there were several mistakes that had already been made that would alter Harris's destiny. Wind, humidity, rotation of the earth, stretch of old rope, and springiness of an elm, leaf, elm tree limb all had been ignored in the computations. But worse, 
far worse. I had laid my board slash weapon down, and we had both forgotten Ernie completely.